my hero is Tazagi. Uh, and in the year that I was working for my professor, he sent me off on one or two field projects. And he lent me a book which had just come out, uh, which was really a, a book that captured uh, Tazagi and the way he works. I mean, I, the sort of thing I can read for you is um, uh, Tazagi's presidential address to the first international conference of soil mechanics. It's, it's something that should be read every Christmas day by every <laughs> civil engineer. But I'll just read a paragraph. He's describing the period of transition from early days in soil mechanics through to the modern era. Uh, and uh, this is what he writes. The major part of the college training of civil engineers consists in absorbing of the laws and rules which apply to relatively simple and well-defined materials, such as steel or concrete. This type of education breeds the illusion that everything connected with engineering should and can be computed on the basis of a priori assumptions. As a consequence, engineers imagined that the future science of foundations would consist in carrying out the following programme. Drill a hole into the ground. Send the soil sample obtained from the hole through a laboratory with standardised apparatus served by conscientious human automatons. Collect the figures, introduce them into the equations and compute the result. Since the thinking was already done by the man who derived the equation, the brains are merely required to secure the contract and to invest the money. The last remnants of this period of unwarranted optimism are still found in attempts to prescribe simple formulas for computing the settlement of buildings or of the safety factor of dams against piping. No such formulas can possibly be obtained except by ignoring a considerable number of vital factors. That was Tazagi's writing. He was blowing apart the sort of codified uh, thinking which you just can't have in soil mechanics because you're dealing with nature, a variable material uh, and a very, very complicated material. And he just blew that apart. Well, I suppose the other man who <laughs> has made an impression on everyone's lives has to be Sir, Sir Alex Skempton, uh, who I didn't know very well, I first met him or saw him at a conference in Paris and there was this very tall uh, remote figure, I mean this god who everyone worshipped. Um, I then met him a couple of years later in connection with Britannic House um, and it was very much later on when I came to work at Imperial College that I got to know him well. Uh, as a young engineer, I used to absolutely um, gobble up his articles because he wrote so well. And if anyone wants a model as to how to write a technical paper, Skempton's papers um, actually provide that model because he writes so clearly and so well. So I did model my writing on, on Skem. I used to go to his papers and and uh, say, well, now I wonder what Skempton would have said, or how would he have tackled this problem. One of the things he said in Paris at his presidential address uh, is not widely remembered, but made a profound impression on me, and still comes back. He made the following statement, no amount of optimism by the engineer on behalf of his client will have any impact on the great forces of nature. And again, as soil mechanics uh, engineers, as geotechnical engineers, we are dealing with nature, with the great forces of nature. We're hard up against them. We're actually in touch with them. And uh, you have to be utterly rigorous.